And I call Mrs. Sandra Overend. Mrs. Overend. One, please. Member for her question, a John Corlea, a boy I'm cast to hear, and I was a shock to Corlea Kila. With your permission, uh, Mr. Speaker, I'll answer questions one and seven together. Uh, I have written to the Taoiseach and the Finance Minister in the South of Ireland, assuring them of my department's full cooperation into any investigation by the Irish government uh, into Project Eagle and into the NAMA Cerberus deal. Uh, I haven't had any specific uh, uh, contact with the Public Accounts Committee. Uh, they haven't been in touch with me, but I will, of course, uh, offer any support that the uh, PAC needs in the con conduct of its inquiry or inquiries or investigations. Uh, the, the member can be rest assured that uh, all efforts to reveal the truth of what happened with Project Eagle and what happened subsequent to that in relation to NAMA and Cerberus, uh, any investigations of that nature will have my, my total backing. This is over and for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister. For that response, during yesterday's Opposition Day uh, debate on NAMA, Sinn Féin and the DUP combined to remove references to damage to Northern Ireland's international reputation uh, from the motion. As a frequent visitor himself to our key market of the United States of America, does the Minister not agree that the NAMA scandal uh, has had a negative impact on our political and business reputation? Um, uh, I thank the member for her uh, supplementary question. Uh, I think it's perhaps worth putting on record uh, what did happen yesterday because uh, this House united in majority vote uh, to ask for a full investigation into the uh, NAMA Cerberus deal and to say we would support all investigations. The member will be aware that uh, I, I, have spoke, I spoke yesterday about the NCA, but it's not only an NCA investigation uh, by the law enforcement agencies, also by Angarda Shiakana. Uh, also, of course, by the FBI and the States and by the SEC. It's my opinion, uh, as I travel, um, that when you meet business people, particularly in North America, they look on this deal in two ways. Uh, they believe, as most of us do in this House, that there was something rotten about uh, how the deal was fixed, how it was formed, how it was, uh, how it was brought over the line, and how £7 million ended up in the Isle of Man. Um, and I think they are heartened, uh, business people, that I meet are heartened by the fact that uh, people are revol revolted by that and determined to get at the truth. I think an, an added layer for the member, which will give her I think, some, some heart and some confidence in how we are viewed uh, abroad, is that uh, those in high positions in corporate boardrooms in North America also welcome the fact that the, the purchase of Project Eagle on the American side uh, by, by Cerberus uh, is also the subject of intense investigation by the FBI and the SEC. There are almost two parallel but separate lines of investigation. And I think as well that uh, the people that, that I would meet uh, are, are confident of uh, the resources of the FBI and the SEC uh, to get to the truth of what happened. And I've said this before, uh, I'll say it again, Mrs. Overend, it's my opinion that getting to the truth won't be easy. And, and I really do think we need a, an all-island investigation but in terms of justice, in terms of bringing to book uh, those who were involved in this, what I believe was wrongdoing, I do have a lot of faith, perhaps starting in this level, le level the FBI, S SEC, bringing those uh, who were guilty of wrongdoing to book, then, of course, the NCA, and then the Garda. Can I remind the Minister at this very early stage of question time about the two minute rule? I call Mr. Jerry Mullen. Speaker. Uh, Minister, I have to say that during yesterday's debate, uh, it was hugely disappointing that the DUP and Sinn Féin uh, prevented moves for a, a new inquiry and an all-island investigation, despite the Minister's uh, protestations in that regard. So, would the Minister agree that the actions taken by the executive uh, parties to smokescreen the issues around NAMA's sale of Project Eagle have only further damaged the credibility of the executive and of this government? Well, um, the member may have been at a different debate yesterday, but I, I would say this to uh, Mr Mullen. Um, the debate I was at yesterday and how I voted was to support uh, an all-island uh, commission of investigation into the NAMA Cerberus uh, deal and in the, in, the, in the sale of Project Eagle. Uh, it is my contention and resolve 
The member is new to the House, but I have spent the last 24 months uh, probing this issue and trying to get to the heart of the corruption uh, in relation to the Project Eagle deal. I remain absolutely determined, uh, will not be deflected uh, from my uh, desire and resolve uh, to deliver what the people want. And what the people want is they want the truth uh, of relation to the sale of Project Eagle. So the member may be not a different debate, but Sinn Féin, in this House, if I may speak for Sinn Féin uh, for a moment, Mr. Speaker, but also as Minister of Finance, uh, we will do everything in our power to get the people the result they deserve, and that is to have the truth and also to have the wrongdoers brought to book. Well, Mr. Ian Mill. Controller, I was weak as Foster than I out in a fragration. Um, can I ask the Minister, could he give us a, provide us with an update on his meeting or his recent meeting there with the NCA, Gurumil Mogan? Gurumil Mogan is in cash. I thank the member for his question. I met the NCA in Lisbon uh, last Thursday. Uh, they, as, as, as members of the Finance Committee, will know who have been briefed uh, repeatedly. Uh, will know the NCA remains on course. Uh, all of us, I think, which share frustration at how slow and meticulous these investigations are of necessity. Uh, but that said, the NCA has delivered on the course of the inquiry as, as it pledged to us and as it reported back to the Finance Committee and to me. While the nature of our discussions will uh, have to remain confidential, uh, I am pleased that there has been no let-up in the intent of the NCA uh, to find out not only what happened but uh, in terms of the Project Eagle seal, but to bring those involved uh, to, to, to book. Um, and, and, I, and I would say this in relation to uh, Commission of Investigation, which is being suggested and proposed by the Taoiseach, and I do hope that comes about, and I hope it has an all-island brief. Uh, I think that uh, in, the, in the time ahead, there will be ample opportunity uh, to test the resolve of the NCA on this issue. They too will be, and, and the officers I met understand this, like the executive, like the Minister of Finance, like the Assembly members, like the Finance Committee, they will be tested on their delivery. And I think in this test they are certainly determined to succeed. Well, Mrs. Naomi, look. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Minister has said that it is a test not just for the Department of Finance and for the Executive, but also for members of this Assembly that this is properly investigated. So can I ask him, does he agree with my party leader, David Ford, who has suggested that the party leaders in this Assembly should come together and agree a means by which these matters can be investigated, where there is common agreement around how it's taken forward, particularly in relation to those non-criminal matters which, and allegations which relate to um, inappropriate behaviour in public office. Um, I, thank, I thank Mrs Long for, for her question. I thought that was Stephen Farry's idea yesterday, but if, if David Ford wishes to claim, if David, uh, you know, there, there, are many, many, there are many masters in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a good decision like that. My, my approach, is, as the member knows, is one of inclusion. The uh, Finance Committee hasn't decided what is the most appropriate way forward for it. Uh, the, uh, executive uh, has uh, many ways to uh, continue to support the many investigations into this, and it's my hope that they, they do step up and support all the investigations. But I certainly have no hesitation in saying if parties want to gather together and consider a way forward, they should do that. But perhaps, Mrs. Long, perhaps the way to do that is the Finance Committee, where all parties are represented. And I know the Finance Committee has taken its own counsel in that regard as to what, what their uh, next best steps are. Uh, for, for our part, um, I agree, certainly Mr Farry said this, I don't know if I caught Mr Ford, um, but certainly Mr Farry said this, it's essential, if we're going to get to the truth of this, that the Commission of Investigation has to have a wide-ranging all-island brief. I hesitate to say it has to go off the island as well, because some of, some of the, the goings-on and shenanigans happened in other jurisdictions, but certainly I agree with Mr Farry that the Commission of Investigation needs to be all-island, and we need to make sure that it can do its work north of the border as well. Well, Mr. Nelson McCausland. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, question number two. Um, I thank the member for his question. Um, the uh, Northern Ireland civil service wage cost for the last four uh, full finan financial years is as follows: uh, 12, 13, uh, 9, 2, 7 million; 13, 14, 9, 5, 1 million; 14, 15, 9, 4, 3 million; uh, 15, 16, 9, 1 million. The wage cost will materially reduce farther in 1617 as the effect of the NICS 
voluntary access scheme, which closed in May 2016, uh, where, where, where it has a, a full year impact. Mr. McCausland, for supplement. Thank the member for his answer there, and it is encouraging to see that there has been um, a reduction in the wage bill because it enables more money to go out to uh, frontline service, although obviously some of the civil service work is frontline service. Um, in terms of the next number of years, does he have some uh, indication or some thoughts around what the likely uh, spend will be over the next couple of years? Will it remain static, or is it likely to see some significant increase or not? Well, I think the member is, is concentrating on the NICS, and I understand that I have, I have responsibility for the civil service, but he will know as well that the Foundry Access Scheme extends beyond that. Uh, and it's my view that the reason we are able to make the books balance, the reason we are able, Mr. Given was recently able to give extra money to libraries, the reason uh, I was able to pledge more money for life prolonging drugs, the reason why we were able to put more money into entrepreneurship and building the economy is because we have reduced the size of government. Uh, we have made sure that uh, our, our colleagues in the civil service and the public sector uh, were able to exit with good terms, a great package. Uh, but at the same time, if we have, <coughs> excuse me, have only nine departments, then we don't need as many people to provide the services. So I would be hopeful in the time ahead, while I think the civil service has done its bit, they have lost uh, over 10% over of their workforce uh, on the, under the Foundry Access Scheme. But I hope there are other back office jobs that in the time ahead uh, the people who want to retire will have the opportunity to do so, that we will not affect the quality or the excellence of the service, but that some of these back office jobs can go. And in that respect, Mr McCausland, I think you'll acknowledge the digital revolution that we're in the, the midst of gives us an opportunity to do jobs more efficiently and perhaps not with the same numbers of staff. Mr Robbie Butler. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, Minister, last week it was revealed that the Northern Ireland Civil Service absence rate had increased again to 11.7 days. Is the Minister concerned that the unsystematic uh, rollout of the voluntary exit scheme contributed to this deteriorating performance? Um, well, I, I thank the member for his question. I'm always concerned when we get uh, sickness figures, um, and, and I, I have studied them in depth at the time. I resisted the temptation which the UUP couldn't resist to have a dig at the public sector and have a dig at the civil service. In my opinion, our public sector uh, performs heroics every day, whether it's in our, our, our museums, our art galleries, our libraries, our hospitals, our schools. And we need to stand behind the civil service and applaud and commend their work. Uh, sickness levels are higher than I wish them to be. I wonder if the Ulster Unionist Party would like to give us their sickness, their sickness tables for the year and compare them with the civil service. People do get sick. Uh, this is a tough job people do in the public sector. Uh, and I think instead of sniping at those who have been uh, ill during the year, instead of that we should be reinforcing our determination to, to build an excellent public sector and provide our people with the frontline services they need. <coughs> Ms. Linda Dillon. Can, thank you to the Minister for his answer so far. Can the Minister tell us what savings the voluntary access scheme has produced that can be reinvested into frontline services within our communities? Yes, yes I can. I don't think I, I mentioned the figure earlier on in, in, in response to Mr McCausland, but the, the, the global figure for savings uh, in the wage bill is around £150 million. Um, I know the, the opposition is, is always interested in contributing to the debate around the budget and where the money should be spent, uh, but they should acknowledge for a minute that the reason there is uh, additional money to spend on frontline services is because of the prudent way we have managed the voluntary exit scheme. The people leave with good packages, they are rewarded and thanked uh, for their contribution, but we take the money we save and we put that right back out, right back out to build a shared and prosperous future. We, want, we wish to see. And in that regard, Mr. Speaker, it is around £150 million saved per year going right back into the budget. Mr. Ritchie McPhillip. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Could the Minister advise as to how many civil servants and employees of public bodies earn in excess of 100000 per annum? No, no, I couldn't, but I'm very happy to get that figure uh, for him. Uh, I suspect that um, at our top level, at our very top level, um, at the top grades, we have about 120 uh, civil servants. I'm very happy to report back to the member in writing uh, in relation to exactly what wages those people get. Well, Mr. Stephen Farr. Thank you, 
<coughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Arising from the voluntary access scheme, but also combined with the reorganisation of departments, and also now uh, warnings we're getting about the, the difficulties with the relocation of Deira uh, to Ballykelly. Um, does the Minister, given his responsibility for the civil service, have any concerns around business continuity into the, fu into the future? Um, I, I thank the member for his question, and I, and I would advise him not to listen too much to warnings. Um, listen, listen to the uh, dear Minister when she comes in, uh, and, I, and I think, uh, I think uh, you really should spend more time listening to me, Stephen, and stop watching the news. Uh, I think you'll find that, that the, uh, the, the concerns around those issues have, have been exaggerated. And, and yes, is it, is it a time of turbulence? Yes, it is, Mr. Fry. It is a time of turbulence. Is it difficult to, for, for our public sector workers to take on more responsibilities? Yes, it is. Despite that, the evidence I have, and I've travelled around my department, uh, many different uh, offices and, and, and uh, activities that we are involved in, from, from NISRA uh, to the LPS uh, to, to those who are working with me directly, our economists and so on, those working on European funding, I think the business continuity is there to see, Mr. Speaker, and, and I would uh, rest assured, uh, Mr. Farry, that they shouldn't listen to any warnings in that regard. Before I call Mr. Colin McGrath, I remind the members that the next question is a constituency specific question. Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. McGrath. I thought you might help us by mentioning the word Rathkelter to find out if it's Rathkelter or Rathkelter. Uh, but you're asking about the land at the rear of the Rathkelter house in Downpatrick and can it be used to promote access between businesses in the town centre. Mr Speaker, I am advised that neither my officials nor the staff in Rathkelter Rath House are aware of any contact inquiring about the use of this land for the promotion of access between businesses and Downpatrick Town Centre. However, uh, Mr McGrath is obviously working on this issue as a constituency issue, I presume, with the local traders. I would be happy to discuss the issue further with Mr McGrath if he wishes to write to me or bring it up directly with me in my office. Uh, we are always willing to consider any plan that would help our town centres, which are under considerable pressure. Mr McGrath, first supplement. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his response about Rathkelter House. Um, and, uh, the issue that we have with this is the piece of land uh, prevents people from accessing a retail park, which results in us essentially in Downpatrick having an out-of-town uh, retail park and people aren't able to get onto the main street. So whilst I welcome the remarks he's made, could I ask that he would instruct officials to meet with the local council? Uh, this issue was raised as part of the master plan and maybe with the Department of Communities. This is an initiative that is going to breathe life back into the town centre of Downpatrick. We desperately need it and I hope we can get your support. Well, I thank the member for a supplementary. I think, like uh, Carla Lockhart in relation to the health centre bomb bridge, you're making very uh, commonsensical uh, points about joined up government and how government should help uh, to revive our town centre. So you have my, my pledge that I'll do all my part and we'll try and bring the council uh, together with my officials to make sure this, uh, this arrangement in Rathkelter was 50 50, I got it wrong, in Rathkelter houses to the benefit of, of the town. Call Mr. Harold McKay. Mr. Speaker, would the Minister give consideration to allowing pedestrian access across this piece of land or any other piece of land under control of his department to encourage footfall from out of town shopping to the high street? Um, I think any piece of land might be a bit too generous even, even for me, but certainly in this case, yes, I think that's a, a, a reasonable proposition. And I know Mr. McGrath is going to bring that forward. If the member wishes to join him in that, that then I'm content to do so. Certainly, there are a number of issues around government buildings where they're not doing what they could uh, to really build the areas they're in and build community. And in this case, certainly, uh, I would be happy to investigate and see can we do exactly what you're talking about. Call Mr. Philip McGuigan. John Kyoler, Cash Devra Car. Boyle and Boyes, Hort and Colt, as in Cash. I had a, a very positive meeting with council mayors and chief executives on the 22nd of September last Thursday, perhaps the first time that um, uh, any minister perhaps got a chance to meet all the councils because they've just, as you know, reorganised. Uh, we discussed the range of options available to councils that could facilitate greater investment. Uh, I view this meeting as the beginning of a new conversation with local authorities. I was delighted to see so many mayors uh, present and, and represented as well as CEOs. I heard their ideas and plans for economic development in their areas and outlined some of the alternative funding sources 
that could help them realise uh, their ambitions. Uh, my department stands ready to assist our councils in this regard. Uh, I will continue to engage with councils on this and other issues. I look forward to attending the next partnership panel meeting led by Mr. Given, Minister Given between executive ministers and local government elected members on 12th of October. If I could just say to the member, and I say this to everyone in the House because I met at mayors from all parties in the Lisburn uh, uh, Civic Centre uh, last Thursday, and I think this is a, an issue that crosses party political boundaries. Uh, I see more and more evidence of the amalgamated councils wanting to step up, wanting to increase the pace of investment. Uh, and I think when I, when I said uh, at that meeting I would be a champion for councils that wish to step up at the executive table, I think I echo the views of every member here. I think every member here would like to be a champion for their local council if, uh, and step up for them if they will step up as well. Well Ms. Clare Hanna. Uh, Minister for his uh, answers to date. Can the Minister advise if uh, he, he's aware of the concept of a uh, city deal and, and, by way of context, Glasgow leveraged an extra $1.1 billion of infrastructural funding uh, for their city? Did the concept of a regional city deal for NI uh, come up and did the Minister support it? Um, uh, uh, Ms Hannah, you bumped uh, uh, Philip McQuiggan down the list I see there, so, but, but uh, he, may, he may come back uh, later, Mr Speaker. Um, it, 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 did, it did actually come up, but um, the, the young gentleman who brought it up was outside of the meeting for the bit I was at, Mr. Uh, Councillor Tim Atwood, uh, and I know he's an advocate of a city deal or a, or a business zone or a, or a city zone or even a West Belfast zone in his constituency. I have an open mind in that regard, um, and, and what I said to the councils was, look, I have no problem with you exploring other alternative ways of building up your council area, whether that's Belfast, whether it's, whether it's Derry, whether it's Ballymena. But in the here and now, I think we could deliver short term, I mean short to medium term, from our own resources, uh, transformative uh, uh, projects, policies and strategies in each council area. If we ask the British government for, for a city deal, uh, I think that brings us down a different path, but I'm not necessarily against that. Uh, but in the here and now, I think that we do control the Invest NI, uh, the executive controls the Invest NI grant allocation, so we could influence that. We have a good, strong local uh, influence over the transport infrastructure. We control the rates, uh, and I think we should have within our own gift enough powers and resources and ability to make a difference in, in, in our council areas. But if people want to come up with other ideas, I'm happy for, those to, for them to pursue those. But what I would say, Ms Hannah, is the things I'm interested in are what will really make a difference uh, today and tomorrow. I passed over Mr. McGuigan for a supplementary. Mr. McGuigan. Mr. B. Kion Kyolier, Sean Magalore, August. Can I uh, just ask uh, the Minister, given that he's uh, given uh, growing terms with regard to the new councils and the fact that European funding is essential uh, to uh, councils, can I ask, was there any concern expressed during the meeting with regard to the future of EU funding? Um, uh, what, what I said to the councils as we left, that we left the meeting, um, when they said you're going to be our champion, I said it would be for the champion which, for the councils who want to invest and do more, who want to borrow and invest and really build uh, their towns and cities and villages. Um, so I am commending the great work that's been done to rationalise councils, but I'm also saying that those who want to take the next step forward, I think they are the people who I would like to really partner in government. EU funding came up at the meeting raised by some of the representatives from uh, Newry, Mourne and Down. I don't know if I have that order uh, correct. Um, and in relation to peace funding and inter -egg funding, and inter -egg funding in particular, Mr Speaker, because I know that's of grave interest and deep interest to the members, uh, the statement from the British Chancellor, Mr Hammond, uh, on the 12th of August falls short, as you know, of what I would like to have seen, particularly in relation to peace and inter -egg cross border programmes. Uh, what we had from the Chancellor was a commitment that project approvals, uh, which were uh, made and uh, committed in advance of the autumn statement, uh, we know that would be November 23rd, uh, he had said he would underwrite those, um, those particular letters of offer and those contracts. Um, I believe that's insufficient because it leaves at risk 1.1 billion euro for other uh, European uh, and other European funds leaves that at risk in the time ahead, and those, those are contracts which we expect to be signed off post November. But it's important to say today to all the members that I'm also concerned about the 500 million euro 
which was to go out before November 23rd. Uh, and I think most of us thought that we had done marvellous work in relation to expediting the application process, uh, that the, all the bodies had stepped up, including local councils, including the interreg partners, to ensure this money got out the door. But at present, uh, Mr. Speaker, we have 120 million euro of letters of offer for cross-border job, environmental and health projects, and they're log jammed in the system. And if you will, with your permission, Mr. Speaker, if I could, if, with your permission, the, the executive, the finance department, especially the EUP, EU peace uh, body, the interreg panels have all stepped up uh, to expedite these funding applications. In fact. I think they've done Trojan work to speed up the process to ensure money is released to the uh, peacemakers and the bridge builders and the entrepreneurs and the job creators on the ground. But I would respectfully suggest in this House that their efforts need to be matched by the Irish Government, the British Government and the EU Commission. Uh, notwithstanding the grave difficulties surrounding the EU referendum, Mr Speaker, all three of those institutions should commit to releasing this €120 million Euro as soon as possible. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I remind the Minister that when you wish to give a prolonged and detailed answer, you should ask for an extra minute at the beginning of your answer. Call Mr Philip Smith. Thank you, Mr. Uh, the Minister will be aware that the rate of transferred functions grant was going to be reviewed uh, when regeneration powers were devolved to local councils uh, to give them the resources necessary uh, to deal with their extra RPA powers. Given the decision uh, by the executive to walk away from this previous commitment to transfer these functions, this review never happened, and councils are still working from the old figure that is now a year old. Can the minister give a commitment that the executive will now bring forward a new 2016 regulation to increase the grant? I thank Mr. Smith. I won't be over two minutes with this particular answer, but that also came up at, at the meeting of councils last week. And what I said to him, I, I, I want to see them have more powers. I want them to see have more competencies. I want to see them be able to step up. But what I also said to them was, don't hesitate. Don't delay. Don't make any excuses. They have enough genius and ability and talent and resources to make a difference in their council areas and in, or in their communities. I understand that everyone's often focused on the next day and more powers, and sometimes the fact that government isn't joined up enough. But what I've said to all 11 councils is, Press on, move forward, build the type of community that you know your ratepayers are entitled to, and we will support you. I hope all these particular issues are resolved in the time ahead, Mr. Smith. But uh, for now, I let no one uh, suggest that the council should pause for a moment in doing the work that they can do in leading economic growth. Call Ms. Emma Little I thank the Minister for his answer so far. And just in relation to an, uh, an earlier answer that he gave in relation to peace funds, can the Minister confirm that there is a very particular problem and challenge at the moment with the Republic of Ireland government in relation to stepping up to the mark? Uh, does he, and I'm sure he does agree with me, that this hesitancy by the Republic of Irish government could cost Northern Ireland a significant amount of money? And what plans does he have to try to ensure that they do step up to the mark to make sure that this money will come through in a timely way? Well, um, the, the 120 million euro I refer to, um, uh, Madam, Chair, Chair, Madam Chairwoman, is relating in particular to interreg funding. Uh, but you are right; the peace money is going to come on stream, and the peace letters of offer will be ready to go out when the panels meet in, in short order. Um, I don't want to get into blaming uh, anyone for the hold-up, but I have said that we have done our bit. The Interstate Ireland, who are waiting for over 10 million euro to support small business in the border region, they have done their work. The letter of offer is ready to go. The health boards on both sides of the border have done their work and are waiting for vital money to fund cross-border health initiatives. Uh, the Donegal and Derry Strabane Council have done their bit in relation to the Greenways, and they're waiting for over 15 million euro to make that happen. So we all have, we all have uh, stepped up to the plate. Three other bodies involved in this, the European Commission, the Irish Government and the British Government, I have asked that they match the uh, intense effort that we have put into this. So I don't want to get into a blame game, but someone needs to, to match our efforts. This money is vital, urgent, and we need to get it released. It is, it is in my view, it is shameful, shameful that the money is log jammed at this stage. Members, that ends the period for listed questions. We now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions. I have to inform the House that topical questions 1, 6 and 8 have been withdrawn. 
I call Mrs. Sander Overend. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I wonder, can I ask the Finance Minister, has he seen the paper produced in May 2015 by the European Policy and Coordination Unit in the Office of First and Deputy First Minister uh, entitled Pre Preliminary Analysis on the Impact of a UK Referendum on its Membership of the European Union? I, I thank the member for her question. It's always a good sign about the importance of a document, how long and how uh, difficult it is to pronounce the title. Um, the, the member will be aware that uh, I commissioned, when I came into this post, uh, my department to carry out contingency planning into the effects of a, a uh, leave vote in the EU referendum. I think that actually that contingency planning, while relevant only to my department, uh, emphasised and highlighted the ferocity of the report prepared by uh, Neil Gibson for Oxford Economics about the potential downside of, of the uh, leave uh, of a leave vote uh, uh, in, in all aspects of our economy, tourism, manufacturing, trade and services. Uh, I think that the, the issues that were highlighted in that document uh, reflect that. Uh, I, don't, I didn't see anything additional there, um, but it, it, is for, for it is, I suppose, uh, added evidence that uh, we are set on a course which is, uh, I think, going to be very challenging in the time ahead. Well, Mrs. Overend, for a supplement. Uh, the Minister uh, successfully managed not to answer my initial question there if he had seen the document or if he hadn't seen the document. Um, has the Minister is as is this surprised as I um, that this document uh, that forecasts such as a major impact on the Northern Ireland economy and finances was neither disclosed either before or during the referendum or even in last week's Brexit debate? Well, I thank the member for supplementary. As you know, I'm never surprised when people agree with me. It doesn't happen very often, mind you, but I think that uh, she, will, she will, I think, accept that the case I have made uh, for, for remaining in Europe, based on, not, not on the politics, set, set the politics to the side for the moment, based on the, the uh, detrimental impact it would have on our community, on our economy, on our tourism, on our education sector, I think that is uh, held up by the document, uh, by the evidence in the document uh, she refers to. What I would say, and, and I, I perhaps have the, the, the privilege of doing this, uh, Mr. Speaker, since I'm not uh, wearing a, a political hat uh, uh, for this discussion, what I would say is there is a real need uh, for all of us uh, to say, in particular to our partners in the Irish government, which is one of the reasons why I was a bit more circumspect than Mrs. Little Pengelly in that regard. The Irish government has a special obligation to make a case. Uh, to the British government at this early juncture about how best uh, this crisis unfolding around the EU referendum can be handled. And I have no doubt that the document to which you refer with its very long title would be helpful to the Irish government in that regard. Well, Mr George Robinson. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr Speaker. <laughs> Mr Speaker, can I ask the Minister, uh, will he work with the Economy Minister and make finance available to develop further air links between Northern Ireland and continental Europe. Well, I thank Mr Robinson uh, for his question. I met uh, the Economy Minister yesterday. Uh, among the topics we discussed was trying to improve connectivity. Uh, he recently visited Germany. You know it's been a, a prize we were seeking for a long time, was a direct link from Belfast into Germany. I believe the Berlin flight uh, has started. I have, a, I have a relative in Ger Germany, but he's not very interested in coming home, but if he was, he's now, it's now a lot cheaper and a lot easier to come back to Belfast. So I think that the Minister is pleased we have delivered that. The use of, of the, the, uh, the Air Connectivity Fund is, is a matter for the Minister, but I also met recently with uh, Brian Ambrose at the city airport, Graham Keddie at the um, international airport, and of course our friends in, in the smaller airport in the Eglinton. Um, but all of them I know are determined to get more connections, and in my view, it's absolutely essential. If we want to reap the benefits of the tourism infrastructure we're putting in place, never mind reap the benefits of our efforts to grow the economy, we need to have more flights coming in to the two large local airports. Mr. Robinson, for a supplement. Thank the Minister for his answer. And would the Minister agree that the recent financial package announced for London Dairy Airport is a vital investment in the Northwest economic future? Well, um, I thank the member for a supplementary. Uh, well, it, it, 
I, I don't rise often enough to say I'm very pleased there was investment in the North West, so you can be sure on this occasion that I am very pleased uh, to hear that. I hope it's just the start uh, of, a, of a series of investments that we can all agree on. And I know Bally Kelly, I think was discussed, or was discussed in my department earlier today. We are working on other pivotal transformative projects, uh, not least two roads into the North West and uh, McGee, McGee College. Um, but I, I do believe that the uh, efforts by Eglinton to try and focus on manufacturing, to try and get an extra added impetus and stimulus and leverage the, the asset they have, I think that's the right way forward. And Mr. Robinson, I hope we can stand here in the time ahead and, and commend them in, in winning that contract for manufacturing, which I know uh, they, are, they are chasing. Call Mr. Philip Logan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, would the Minister consider rates relief uh, for new business start-ups uh, to help provide an incentive for those start-ups uh, and to encourage growth within that sector? Um, we have a very complex, complicated and generous rate relief system, but notwithstanding that, I think if we don't get the entrepreneurship piece right, uh, we are uh, not going to be able to build our economy at the pace we wish to build it. Uh, therefore, uh, I would be happy to look at ways in which we could encourage uh, these entrepreneurial hubs. We have at least two in Belfast, the propeller idea and the entrepreneurial spark on Lombard Street. I think there's one in Ballymena as well. Um, and, I, and I think that if we could look at innovative ways to make it worthwhile for people uh, to set up businesses, especially in clustering, uh, I would certainly be, be happy to look at that. I am convinced that one of the ways to grow our small businesses is to keep them alive as long as possible. Uh, capitals very scarce, hard to get, uh, and I wouldn't like to think that uh, entrepreneurial young people are being put out of business because of the rate. So, if the, if the member wants to come forward with thoughts on that issue, I would look at them sympathetically. But of course, it would be a matter for the assembly. But I think it should, does require looked at sympathetically. Mr. Logan, first supplement. Thank you, and thanks to the minister for his answer. With regard to small independent retailers, do you have any plans for a new targeted rate relief scheme? Um, I, I, I think it comes back to the question from Mr Mullen earlier about Downpatrick and then other areas were mentioned, uh, Bond Bridge was mentioned here uh, earlier. How do we bring life and fatality back to town centres which have taken a bit of a hammering over uh, recent years? Uh, you know, I've been to Port of Down town centre, I've been to Newry town centre. Some of this is to do with out of, out of town supermarkets but much of, it is, much of it is to do with not having enough support for uh, town centre businesses. So, I am looking uh, very seriously at a, a new approach to small business rate relief, which would focus on the independent retailers, because they live locally, Mr. Speaker. Their money that they bring in is distributed around the economy. Every pound we spend locally has a 70p uh, benefit to the economy, whereas we spend in the large supermarkets might only have 15p or 20p benefit for every pound. Uh, so, yes, I will be bringing those, uh, some ideas forward in that regard. For me, the key areas are independent retailers and anything which helps build our tourism uh, uh, products, so hospitality, uh, hospitality, tourism and independent retailers I think are the key areas and hopefully I will be able to bring some suggestions to you in that regard. Call Ms Jennifer McCann. Mr Speaker, can I ask the Minister for an update on his plans for the government's art collection, please? Um, when, when some, some ministers only heard there was a government arts collection last week when it was on the radio and had lots of people rapping the door trying to get some of the beautiful Neville Johnsons and uh, uh, Connors and other wonderful pieces in our art collection. Um, we have 1,400 pieces of work, magnificent work in our art collection. Uh, my desire is to uh, liberate that art collection that it isn't the preserve of either ministers or senior civil servants, but you would see it when you visit your local hospital, your local health centre, uh, your local uh, job advice centre, um, that we make sure that this collection, this wonderful, wonderful treasure that we have, that it is shared with our, our, our citizens. I have one other view, and I brought together a panel of experts led by uh, Dr. Denise Ferran, who is the president of the Royal Ulster Academy, um, uh, and she is also an artist. Uh, and the, the, the other conviction I have uh, and I hope members will support it, is we need to invest in our young artists. That any time, and Mrs. Overland mentioned earlier about travelling and trying to promote business here and business contacts, culture counts. People say they want to come to take up jobs uh, in this jurisdiction because they know there's a strong cultural base. And yet, we don't invest in our own artists. 
at the end of year show, after four years when the graduates uh, leave Ulster University, they have a beautiful show. And the Office of Public Works comes up in Dublin to buy some of the work, um, but we don't buy any work. And we used to. We used to believe in investing in our artists. I think it would be a small amount of money, but artists got to eat too. And I think that we need to put our money where our mouth is. We need to invest in our artists, but we then need to share their work, share their fabulous work with the rest of the community. So I hope that the little panel of experts I've brought together, which includes Royce McDonough, the CEO of the Arts Council, uh, Paul Seawright, who is a great artist, but also the head of the, uh, the Ulster Arts College, Dirty Mackle from West Belfast, and Paul Turrington from PwC. I hope they'll come forward with some ideas around the government art collection, uh, liberating the government art collection, and then starting to restore it. It's been, I don't think this century we have bought any of the artwork produced by our local artists. Um, so when Terence O'Neill revived his minute, collection in the 60s, I don't think he'd be very pleased with what we're doing today, which is disinvesting, uh, divesting in our artists. So I hope uh, Minister, the member will come back again to remind you of the two-minute rule. Call Ms McCann for a supplementary. Thank the Minister for his answer. Can I also ask the Minister, um, just to you mention it in your answer, but does he feel that there's any lessons we can learn from the Irish government's use of its art collection? Uh, Mr. Speaker, I thought it was Simon Hamilton for a minute there. I got carried away. <laughs> Um, yes, the, the OPW has 16,000 works. You can see them all online, a beautiful online catalogue. We don't even have an online catalogue, so all the artistic treasures that we have. And if I may, Mr. Speaker, to share one quick story, and it'll be less than two minutes. When Dr. Denise Ferrin came in to view the art collection, she discovered one of her own artworks that she did 30 years ago, and that was good. But as an extra added uh, bonus, she discovered a work by her husband, Brian Fern from 1967, which we had bought in 1967. So I hope we can match the Office of Public Works in the South and have a really vibrant online catalogue as well as getting the works out to the public. I call Ms Sinead Bradley. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, in the interest of clarity, I would like to give the Minister a third opportunity to answer the question, did he have knowledge of the report or did he not uh, on the preliminary analysis on the impact of a Brexit? Well, I want to thank uh, Mrs Bradley for her question as well, and I'll, I'll, I'll repeat myself again. Um, when you uh, examine uh, the uh, decision I took on the uh, EU referendum, uh, setting aside party politics, it was one of saying that there is no upside economically in this particular uh, vista for us if there is a vote uh, to leave, uh, or if we are forced to leave on the back of a vote in England and Wales. I, I, stand, I stand over that. Uh, if you view the, uh, the work that I did uh, around my uh, contingency paper, you'll see that it's reflected in the, in the predictions in the, in the uh, document you refer to. We have time only for a quick supplementary and a quick answer from the Minister. Can I assume then from the Minister's answer that he did have sight of the document ahead of the referendum? I'm, 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 happy, I'm happy to repeat for, for Mrs Bradley that I, I'm, I'm content that the position I took around the contingency plan we did in the position and the position we outlined uh, is correct. And I think that time, time will tell, without, without going into the politics of it, time will tell that we have huge challenges ahead in terms of offsetting the impact of the efforts to push us out of Europe. Benefit of, benefit of a brief answer means Mr Chris Little gets a question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask the Minister what work he has undertaken to tackle uh, the cost of division, as outlined by the Ulster University report, to be in the region of £850 million per year to Northern Ireland? Well, I thank the member for his question and for, I hope he's thankful to me for letting him in by my brevity. Uh, I'm supportive of, of many of the measures which his party has championed around reducing the cost to our society of division. Um, you, you, and of course, these matters don't fall to my department, but I have made it clear to every department I deal with, uh, including uh, Minister Given, who's just joined us, including Minister Weir, where, where they can bring people together, uh, they should do so, and I do believe there is a cost saving in that. Members, that concludes uh, questions.